I believe you give sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands, that your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace, the God of creation knows me by name. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Over Isle Reformed Church on this Memorial Day weekend. The Lord is faithful. Yesterday, now, and always. That's good for us to remember. And as we gather on this Memorial Day weekend, I just wondered if, uh, if we could have anybody who has been in the military or is in the military, if you would stand for us, if you have served in any branch of the military. Yeah, we have several. Let's give them a hand, shall we? We are here today because of those who have served, those who have given their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy today. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And there will be at Memorial Day observances tomorrow, there'll be hundreds and thousands of names read in cemeteries across this area and across the land. And we will remember those whose names are read. But there is one name that is above every other name, and that's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's because of what he has done for us and the example that he gave to give his life for us, that we can do that for others. And so that's the spirit that we come here in this morning to worship that most holy name of Jesus Christ and to give praise and glory to him for all that he has done for us. And uh, so many blessings that we have, this great land that we live in, all the freedoms we enjoy is all because of Jesus Christ and uh, those who have followed after him and given their lives for our freedoms. So before we begin to worship, let's begin with prayer, shall we? 
God and Father, we are just so thankful for the opportunity to gather here this morning to praise and worship your name. And as we commemorate Memorial Day this weekend, as we think of those who have given their lives in service to our country, as we recognize those who have served or are serving in our country, in the military even now, we thank you because we know that all the blessings that we enjoy come from you. And uh, we just pray now that your spirit would move among us here this morning during this worship, that we would worship you as the one and only who deserves true praise and worship. And may we remember all this as we celebrate this weekend, as we join maybe with family or friends, as we do some uh, relaxing or fun things. May we always keep in our mind that we are blessed because of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. So just bless our worship this morning. As we raise it up to you, may it be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and greet one another, say happy Memorial Day, and then we will begin to worship some more.
Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing, God Oh, powerful depths of my heart. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You can be seated. Wonderful lyrics describing the character of God and maybe as you were singing a moment ago, you were thinking of the omnipotence of God and how God is omnipresent and how he is omniscient. He knows everything. He's that great. And you were singing to your creator, and I trust your redeemer as well as a believer in Jesus Christ, how great and awesome God is. And what you do when you worship God like that is you take your eyes off yourself and you lift your eyes to your creator and maker. The quickest way to sadness in this world is to turn your eyes upon yourself. The quickest way to joy is to turn away from yourself and to keep looking to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you spend endless days examining your belly button, you're going to be a really sad person to be around. So get your eyes off your navel. Get them on the creator of heaven and earth, and let him guide your life and trust him with all the consequences. Amen? Let's pray together. God, there is so much teaching and so much rich theology in your holy word from Genesis to Revelation telling us to put our eyes upon you. And now with the full revelation of Jesus Christ before us to turn our eyes upon him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we are immersed in a generation of younger and older people who are constantly assessing and evaluating their public image, 
trying to present the best possible Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, social media image they can. It's as though the, everybody wants the whole world to notice them. Well, Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a whole different perspective. We want the whole world to notice and know Jesus Christ. In our life, with all of its foolishness and struggles and heartache and sinfulness, is a platform for the mercy and grace dispensed from heaven, won and achieved by the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they might see you in us, and we might live for the sole reason of being light reflectors of Jesus Christ. So give us an end to our narcissism, our pride. May our ego die and Christ rise up within us so that all that is left is the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ in our midst. God, we overly analyze ourselves. And it's good to let the Scripture speak to us and to deal with our sin and confess it to you. But to be obsessed with our looks, to be obsessed with our appearance, to be obsessed with image management, as almost every clothing commercial is, is to turn our eyes away from you. Lord, on this wonderful morning when we celebrate Pentecost, the arrival of the Holy Spirit, to a group of men and women in the upper room upon whom tongues of fire rested as it were and the violent wind from heaven shook the room and thousands were gathered in Jerusalem because of the noise and the spectacle of the Spirit being poured out as promised over centuries in the Old Testament. The Christian church was underway. And we thank you today that we can celebrate the gift of the Spirit purchased by the achievement of the cross of Jesus and His resurrection. And we thank you, Lord, that our life is not about pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, but about depending on the indwelling Holy Spirit who comes like a dove, like a fire, who fills the belly with the Lord Jesus Christ and who leads us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We praise you, O God, that the Spirit who brooded over the face of waters in that early creation week is the same Spirit who now makes our body a temple of the Most High God. You do not live in temples built by human hands. All the earthly temples around the earth matter not a whit. The only temple that matters is the temple of God in heaven and the temple of those in whom the Spirit of Jesus Christ now dwells. And that Spirit is our power for living, our strength in suffering, our courage when we are faint-hearted against and toward people who are fighting against the faith of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for coming in the fullness of time. And we praise you now that the Spirit of grace and mercy, the Spirit of comfort, the Spirit of life is within us. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we would be disconnected from you and from each other. But by the Holy Spirit, we are united in one accord in the body to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that on this memorial day, we can remember those who have given their life in service to the Lord Jesus Christ and those who have given their life in service to this country. We thank you for those who have served in any form of the military of this land to protect the great freedoms we enjoy as a land. And we pray that these freedoms would continue to spread with greater fervency and power from shore to shore, that this nation would once again be a beacon and a light for all who need rest and want to find freedom of faith and religion. And mostly, we promote the Lord Jesus Christ above everything else, Lord. No matter what government a nation may be under, Jesus Christ is always the way, the truth, and the life. The Christian church finds its way under communism, under democracy, and a Republican government, under dictators, under all sorts of governments throughout history. The church still stands. In fact, 
all of history is church history because you have been forming your church since early in the Garden of Eden all the way to 2023 Memorial Day weekend. History is about the church and the church is about history. And we get that in our minds and hearts from the Bible and from your great theological plan to build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it until the dawning of the day when Jesus Christ appears and every eye will see him and every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, finally, we have a host of people who need special prayers this morning. They're in assisted living. They're in care facilities. They're confined to their home. They're recovering from surgery. We think of Laura Folkert and her recent fall and pray for her ongoing healing and recovery, Lord and so many others. God, thank you. Thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for purchasing your church and our salvation and our eternal life, for canceling hell, for giving us the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us in this life. We thank you that as we now enter this song of faith, we want to live for you and we want to keep deciding to follow you by the power of the Holy Spirit because our sins are forgiven. They're forgiven, Lord. There's someone, there's a few people, many people perhaps, who came into this sanctuary this morning needing the main truth of the gospel. They've sinned this week. They've been where they shouldn't have been. They've looked at what they shouldn't have looked at. They've said what they shouldn't have said. They're living with guilt right now in this place. And they came to know that that guilt can be forgiven through Christ. They came to find out, perhaps, if they're not a Christian, is there grace for me? Is there mercy for me? Did Jesus die for me? And the answer is trust in Him. And you will find Him a worthy Savior, a forgiving Savior. So thank you, Lord. Thank you so much that the sins of thought and word indeed, are forgiven. They're in the sea of forgetfulness, as you tell us in the Old Testament. And you've placed a no fishing sign in that sea, and we're not going to go fishing those sins back up. We're going to leave their guilt and shame in the depths of the muck. We are children of the living God. We are indwelt by your Holy Spirit. You have written upon our forehead and our right hand, Mine. We belong to you, sealed by the Spirit, now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing two hymns, Living for Jesus and Following Him.
You may find your seat, and then with me, uh, find the only truly God-breathed book in the history of the human race, and that is the Holy Bible. Let's open God's Word together this morning to the Gospel of John one more time as we continue to make our way through this fourth gospel with much delight and so much teaching from Jesus. I believe that this gospel is already transforming us, and I'm sure you have some portions of this gospel that have really spoken to you and helped you in your Christian life. And if you're not a Christian and you've been joining in with us, we hope that the story of Jesus written by the disciple who was probably closest to Jesus is speaking to you and you're sensing in your heart the Lord calling you to come to him as you consider the claims of Christianity in a world of thousands of religions. And when you truly come to Jesus Christ, you will realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and we want that for you. Well, this morning we return to John chapter 9, and we are in a series entitled, While It Is Day. And there are four powerful truths in John chapter 9 about while it is day. And of course, we learned last week that Jesus begins this healing of the blind man with the words in verse 4, while it is day, night is coming when no one can work. And this whole chapter, like so much of his teaching, is designed by Jesus to teach his disciples how to carry out and further his ministry after his death and resurrection. They don't understand all of this yet. But Jesus is teaching them so they can teach others. And so there is an evangelistic thrust in this passage. While it is day, we must work the works of him who sent me. Verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming. And that's a reference to death. Your night is coming. My night is coming. And we will die. The metaphor can also be used for the night of eternal death. And so we want to help people escape their coming night. But for our consideration this morning, we're, we're going to learn that while it is day, you can use your Jesus story to point people to Jesus. While it is day, Jesus is the way, verses 1 through 7. We looked at that last time. While it is day, use your story to point people to Jesus, verses 8 through 12, which I'll read in a minute. While it is day, expect resistance and opposition to your Christian faith, verses 13 through 34, and we'll look at this next week. And then while it is day, while you have life, the goal is worship. The goal is to so share Christ with others that they become worshipers of the Lord. And you know that. It's not simply about getting somebody saved. Only God saves people. But God saves people not as an end in itself. Salvation isn't the end. Salvation is the means to worship. Because from before the foundation of the world, God's purpose in even creating humanity was to surround himself with a group of people from every eventual tongue, tribe, and nation who will worship him and his son forever. And I think in much of the evangelical church, our only goal is salvation. 
And salvation is huge. But salvation is to lead to the true worship of God. And so all these Christians today who are bailing out on Sunday worship from the gathered community of saints and all these people who say, well, I kind of like Jesus, but I don't like the church or I don't want to be around Christians, that's a falsehood. And you and I know many of them. They've reached a dead end. Salvation leads to the worship of the living God, whether it's with five people or 5,000 people. And so this morning, we want to look at this snippet from the healing of the blind man in verses 8 through 12 that I think will really help us learn how to use our Jesus story in evangelism and in witnessing to others. And I know as I speak to you this morning, there's a number of us who are scared to share our faith with others. The cat's got your tongue. Or better said, the devil is holding you back. And the earlier you learn that, the earlier you will fight against the resistance of Satan to use your life for Christ in that way. And sometimes we can bury ourselves so busily in the life of the church that we forget the six days of the week is your opportunity and mine to go and tell. We invite people to church, that's come and see. But then when we're done worshiping our God, we go and tell. The six days are fueled by the one day. And the one day refuels us for the six days. But if you're not going and telling by how you live and move and have your being, you're living below your calling as a Christian. And you're just plodding through time. So let's look at this together. It's very fascinating. Verses 8 through 12. Uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, we've learned about the healing of the blind man. Now here's what happens next in our story. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. I am the man. I am the man. So they said to him, then how are your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and pray for one another this morning. Lord Jesus, as you instruct us now on how you want us to be similar to this blind man who then was able to see. We pray that where the shoe fits this morning, we will wear it. And how you want us to point people to you will become very prominent now while it is day in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. People need Jesus Christ. That is why God sent Jesus Christ to this earth. God did not send Jesus Christ to this earth because earth is paradise. God sent Jesus Christ to this earth because there is a tremendous battle for the souls of men and women. And the destiny of every human being is one of two, heaven or hell. And the destiny of every human being is forever. We praise God for the inscrutable wisdom and mystery of divine grace from the foundation of the world. We praise God for choosing a people to be his very own. But there's also the teaching in the Bible 
that we are called as a church to go and make disciples of all nations and drop the seeds of eternal life wherever we can and let God do what God does because God is God and he will have his way. This beautiful gospel story of the man born blind whom Jesus healed is a great illustration for the church of Jesus Christ and for your personal life of how Jesus steps into our lives and heals us and then we become witnesses of that life-changing grace. The story now shifts from Jesus and his disciples and the blind man in verses 1 through 7 to the blind man and neighbors and those familiar with his life of begging as a blind person. And this story should help you arise and shine for Jesus and to make Christ known more and more. The blind man's story is really every believer's story. And so let's see how all of us fit this story today. While it is day, use your story to point people to Jesus. This is the theme, this is the truth, because this is what the blind man is doing in this story. He's beginning to realize that I'm called to point people to Jesus because of what Jesus has done in my life. And I'm wondering as we enter this message this morning, do you realize that? I hope you do in the minutes to come. So let me share with you four precious, simple applications from these verses about how you and I while it is day, while we have life, while we are still on planet earth, we can use our story to point people to Jesus and his story. Recently, I met a pastor I admire who's older than I am. And I saw him for the first time in a little over two years. And we looked at each other and we gave each other a great big man hug and I said, how you doing? He said, good. He asked me, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing well as I can be. And I said, how's your ministry going back in this state? And he says, I'm no longer there. And I said, where are you? He goes, God called me back to Michigan. I said, he did. And you're 72 years old? And he said, no, Mike, I'm 74. And I'm planting a brand new church. I said, you're planting a church at 74? You're not coming on to take on a 175-year-old church at 74? They're actually letting you and your denomination plant a church at 74? Yeah! And he's as sharp as a tack, a constitution like a bull. And I just thought to myself, 74? And this man still is going strong for Jesus. He's planting a church at 74 because he wants to point people to Jesus as long as he's alive. So while it is day, use your story to point people to Jesus, number one, because you have been changed by Jesus. Verses 8 and 9a. Let's look at this together. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. So neighbors who knew this man for many years in this town and others who saw him begging because that was customary in those days in Israel knew he had been blind from birth. And you will remember from last week that Jesus didn't just heal him from an injury. Jesus repeated what God did when he made Adam. And out of nothing, Jesus created sight that had never existed. And so this was a recreation. And this was a testimony that Jesus is God. And so people 
knew that he had been blind since birth. His parents probably were sad at first, and then they learned to adjust to a child with unique needs, as parents eventually do, who have children that are born with unique needs. And he could hear, and he could learn, and he could speak as a little boy. He could run and play in different ways. But he was blind. And the community, if you will, knew this. So he now is standing, he's walking, he doesn't need assistance, he doesn't have a cane, and they see him, and he resembles the man who they saw most of the time hunched over, or led along by other people, or sitting down as he begged. And they say, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he, others said, no, but he is like him. So they didn't even know for sure, 100% if this was the man, but he sure resembled this man. He sure looks like him. He sounds like him. Same silhouette, same profile. This is amazing. That's why I love the Word of God. There's so much truth in simple statements like this. And what is it? The blind man now has a Jesus story because Jesus Christ has changed him. This is only the start. In the next 60 minutes of his life in John 9, a lot's going to happen. But Jesus has started to change his life. And the application is really, really simple. While it is day, use your Jesus story to point people to Jesus because you have been changed. You have been changed. And I think it's important for us in the Reformed world of Christianity to understand what it means to be changed by Jesus Christ. Because one of the comments I've heard mostly as a pastor over these many decades is that I don't have anything to tell people. I don't have a dramatic conversion. I don't have a big turnaround in my life. I don't have a story. Nonsense. Where did that lie come from? How did you take that into your spiritual system? To begin with, you know that the healing of the blind man points to spiritual vision. The healing of blind people was the number one miracle in the four Gospels that Jesus Christ performed, and rightly so. Because the miracle of healing blind people was done to heal their physical blindness, but like lepers, lepers being cleansed by the Lord was designed to show us the cleansing of our sin. And the healing of the deaf was designed by the Lord to show us that we can now hear the voice of the Lord. The healing of blind people by Jesus was designed in the first century and all through church history to show us that only God can give us spiritual vision. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have what the Bible calls spiritual vision. That is, you see God for who He is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A Christian will confess that because the Spirit enables their, the eyes of their heart to see in Scripture that God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. And you've been changed because you now see Jesus as Lord and Savior. You see, as we say in Christianity, the manger, cross, and empty tomb for what they are. The manger, the Son of God in human form. The cross, the Son of God dying for the sin of the world. Bearing our sin and shame. Drawing People from north, south, east, and west to feast at Abraham's wonderful banquet table. You see Jesus dying as he says, it is finished. And you know the atonement is done. My sins are forgiven. And you see Jesus' empty tomb. And you say he rose from the dead literally and bodily. You see that as a believer. If you don't see that with the eyes of your heart, you're, you're not a Christian. The man physically sees, but by the end of the story, he spiritually sees who Jesus is. And Jesus has started to save him. Jesus is starting to bring him along. You have been changed by Jesus. So the question 
I ask for this first thought is this. What has Jesus done for your life? He has saved you. He has regenerated you. He has given you new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of his son, God's son, Jesus Christ. You've been forgiven. He's led you. He's helped you. He's taken you through surgeries. He's given you a spouse. Think of this right now. Husband and wife, believers in Jesus, you would not be married to the person you are today if they were not a Christian. If God had not opened your eyes to see Jesus or if God had not opened their eyes to see Jesus. The reason you married each other for mostly is because of your common faith in Jesus Christ. That's a major change. You're married because of Jesus. Think of that. You've discovered and learned so much over the years. But the first thought I want to leave you with this morning is this. You know more about Jesus today than the disciples did at this moment in their lives. And you know more about Jesus Christ and his life-changing power today than the vast majority of people on planet Earth. So never think I don't have enough knowledge. Don't ever think I haven't had a dramatic experience with the Lord. Your knowledge of Christianity, if you've grown up in the church, and the changes that God has done in your life since he saved you, which we call sanctification. That's way more than probably 65% of people on this planet know about God. You have all you need to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Amen? You have all you need. Oh, I got to grow more. I got to learn the Bible better. That's always important. But I'm saying as you sit here this morning on this Memorial Day Sunday weekend, this Pentecost Sunday, you right now can go to the ends of the earth and share Jesus Christ with anyone on the face of the earth. Maybe in this auditorium or sanctuary today is the next George Whitfield. Maybe there's the next Susanna Wesley, Amy Carmichael, Fanny Crosby. Maybe there's the next Charles Spurgeon. Who in here is going to be raised up to serve the Lord and go to the ends of the earth? Or who's going to go down the road to Speedway? And while you're both waiting for your tanks to be filled, gulp, 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 three fifty, four dollars a gallon. Wow, this is expensive. But I know someone who paid it all. What do you mean? You getting your gas free? No. Who paid for all our sins? I mean, it's so simple and easy. In restaurants and lines at the grocery store for five minutes just to bring up the subject of Jesus, the one we love so much. And one of the reasons why I think we struggle is because we haven't had that dramatic conversion. We're all so scared. But sometimes it's because some of us live what's called a ho-hum Christianity. We just kind of go through the motions. We're like an old-fashioned oxen that's tethered to the post and just walks around all day or the mule, or the donkey, just finding whatever they can, grinding and grinding away. You need to cut your tether with the routine and go out and let your light so shine before others. <clears throat> I love the story of the ophthalmologist or eye doctor in Dallas who was a Christian. And this was in the day when they had flip charts and people would come in for their eye examinations. And he made one flip chart that said, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. So he would do cataract surgery, and he'd give his patients the ability to see again. And then they'd come in for their checkup. And when they came into their checkup, he would say this, and I quote, let's see how you're doing. And he would have them read, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And they would say, wow, I can read better. God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. What does that mean? I like that doctor. I want to go to that doctor. You see, whether you're a doctor or a plumber, whether you're a maid or a sir, whatever you do in life, there's a thousand and one ways to get Jesus into the conversations. And think of how often our, our tongues are tied and we're mute. Number two, you have been changed. That's the, that's the premise of the whole thing. God has changed you. Oh, by the way, before we go on to number two, has God changed you? I mean, have you received Jesus Christ? Have you repented of your sin? That's where it all begins. 
the life change of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, says Paul, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, which means everybody on planet earth. Number two, while it is day, use your story to point people to Jesus by owning your Christian life and change, owning the change that Jesus has made in your life. And one of my concerns as a pastor is that we are not owning the change that Jesus has brought in our life. You say, but Mike, I was saved 70 years ago. Wonderful, but that has no bearing on owning your Christian life today. It's so long ago. Here's how you can own your life in Christ. Notice now the last part of verse 9. The neighbors are asking what's going on. And now he kept saying. Now the tense of the verb in the Greek, he kept saying, means he kept saying it over and over again. Notice the words, I am the man. I am the man. He kept saying, no, I am the man, neighbors. I am the man, friends. I've been sitting here all my life begging. I am the man you knew me to be, but I've been healed. I can see for the first time in my life, I am am the man. Jesus changed me. He gave me sight. I've never seen anything in all my life. I've heard the birds sing, but now I can see them. I've heard people all around me. Now I know what they look like. I don't have to put my hands on their ears or their nose and cuddle their, underneath their chin and see who they are. I can see the animals. I can see the sun. I can see the trees. I am the man. What's going on here? He's owning his story. And you need to own your story. And one reason why we don't share Jesus as much as we should with others is because we haven't learned how to own our story. I want to tell you how to own it right now with four words. God's grace, goodness, greatness, and gift. Number one. How do you own the story of what God has done in your life? It begins, first of all, with God's grace in your salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. And it's not of works lest anyone should boast. God has instilled faith in your heart. You didn't drum up the faith on your own strength. You don't have that kind of strength. Faith itself is a gift. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through the Word of God, Romans 10. But the first thing you have to come to terms with is you didn't save yourself. God saved you. Some people believe that God does 50% and I do the other 50%. That's not found anywhere in the Bible. God has saved you 100%. He was in, in the foundation of the world. In that moment, before God made the foundation of the world, He had chosen you to believe. And in the fullness of time, you came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Not by might, nor by the Spirit, nor by, by works, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So the first thing a Christian comes to realize is that they're not sustaining their life in Christ. They didn't regenerate their life in Christ. They've been born of the Spirit. It's all of God's grace. And the more you know it's all of God's grace, the more you will want to point people to Jesus. Because who knows, out of the 10 people you share Christ with over the next couple of weeks, three or four or five might come to faith in Jesus. So grace, it's all about the grace of God in your soul and in your life. Number two, you own your story of Jesus Christ, not only because of God's grace, but secondly, because of God's goodness in your life. God's goodness in your life. Once God has saved you and now you start worshiping the Lord and living for Jesus, you realize, oh, he's a good, good father. Grace saves you. The goodness of God guides you and leads you through all the stormy blast. 
And so one of the things you want to concentrate on is the goodness of God. How good God has been to me. And I don't want to hoard the goodness of God. I want to tell people about how good God is. Look at your culture, friends. Depression, mental illness, suicidal ideations, constant comparing with other people, social media battering young girls and boys. Everybody's confused about their humanity. But oh, we have a good, good God. And that's what you want people to know. God is so good. How good has he been to you? You see, your story isn't simply the story of how he saved you. Some of us can tell that story in 30 seconds. Your whole story is about how good he's been to you. And with many, many people, that's where you want to begin. You don't necessarily begin with, Jesus died on the cross for your sin and my sin. Believe in him today. You'll get there. But people need to hear the story of a faithful God, a caring God, a loving God, a tender God, a merciful God, how he's carried you through difficult times and trials. I was talking to an elderly man recently. And I, I asked him his story. And I saw a little tear come out of the side of his eye. And he began to tell me, I, hadn't, I didn't know him. I'd never met him in my life. And without hesitation, this man, now in his 80s, looked up with a tear in his eye and said, my wife died in December. And I said, how long were you married? And then he came a little closer to me and bent over and he said, 69 and 3 quarter years. And then I said, you know what? My mom and dad were married 49 and 3 quarter years. And when my dad had dementia, he once asked me, Michael, were mom and I married 50 years? And I said, Dad, you and mom were married 50 years. And so I said to this man, you were married 70 years, weren't you? He goes, yeah, we were married 70 years. I go, how are you doing? What a change for you. All this life together as a couple. He said, you know what's getting me through? And now there's double tears. You know what's getting me through? I go, no, tell me. He said, she had a Bible. And she underlined so many verses and passages in her Bible. And in the last season of her life, she was underlining. And I now take my wife's Bible and I read all the verses she underlined. And I know that she's with Jesus and I'll see her again. And as I'm reading these verses, I'm comforted by knowing she was comforted by them too. And so we talked a little bit more. And then I said, uh, I'll, uh, maybe we'll see each other again. And he looks at me. Now, he's becoming the pastor. I'm becoming the church member. He says, oh, I will see her again in glory. And I said, yes, you will. Within that five-minute moment, he shared with me the goodness of God. You can share stories of the goodness of God with anyone. God's grace, God's goodness. Here's another one, another letter word that begins with G. God's greatness in your life. God's greatness. Not only do we have the, the grace of God and the goodness of God, but the, the greatness of God in your life. You say, you mean like because God made the world and he's so great? No, no, no. I mean, that's true. But the greatness of God in your personal life. You say, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It's not an easy thought, but let me begin like this. As a Christian, when you think of the number one and number two sin you struggle with, what is it? You know what it is. Your hardest sin that you're battling and you fall sometimes and you need forgiveness again. What are the toughest sins you deal with? Now, here's where the greatness of God comes in. 
if his grace had not saved you, those sins you struggle with now the most as a Christian would have destroyed you by now. That's the greatness of God, that he saves you before those sins we still struggle with destroy us. Think of the monsters we'd be. Think of the relationships that would be hurt if we lived out those sins that we still struggle with. Isn't God great? He's great in wisdom. He's great in timing. He's great in his patience with us. Fourthly, not only the grace and goodness and greatness of God, but when the man says, I am the man, he's realizing that he has a gift from God, and so it's God's gift to you. You see, the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ to you and me is not our own. Because it's a gift, it is to be what? Shared with others. I am the man. You are the woman. You are the teenager. You are the child. You are the balcony worshiper at Over Isil. You are the down below worshiper at Over Isil. You are the online worshiper with Over Isil. But you are the man, the woman, the boy, or the girl. And to say that before God and say, what a gift. I'm a child of God adopted into his family. And I'll own my faith. So you own your faith by realizing the grace, goodness, greatness, and gift of God in your life. Now you can say, I am a Christian. Are you sure? Because if you do not deny your faith, you're going to jail. I am the man. I will not betray the grace, the goodness, the greatness, and the gift of God in my life. So help me, God. Amen. Number three, you have been changed by Jesus. Own your Christian story with Jesus. Now look at verses 10 and 11. Here we learn that while it is day, you are to use your story to point people to Jesus and share what Jesus has done for you. Verses 10 and 11. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? I mean, they want to know how this happened because as we'll learn later in the story, no one in the history of the world has been known to be healed from blindness at birth. So how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus. Now, this is just so instructive here. We looked at the actual action of Jesus last week, but now we're going to look at something else. He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. I mean, that's it. That's it. The blind man now shares what Jesus did for him. Plain, simple, he just shared it. While it is day, you can learn to use your story to point others to Jesus. And here's how. Just like the blind man, number one, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Mud, eyes, I washed, I could see. Get your story, your Jesus story, down to one or two basic things. Remember, you're not a preacher putting people to sleep. Keep it simple. Save your long version of the story for your grandchildren. Or for those who ask for it. Keep it short. Keep it short and simple. You can, use, you, you can probe somebody and get into somebody's heart and mind with one or two sentences. Keep it under a minute at first. If they ask for more, give them more. If not, stop and ask them if God's at work in their life. There's ways to do this. Keep it simple. You, you don't have to get into all the theology. That's why I said a few minutes ago, you have more knowledge of the Bible and Jesus Christ and more experience with the Lord than the disciples did at this moment, even after their three years with Jesus, and most of the people on planet earth today. This entire congregation can leave here in, in 15, 20 minutes and just spread across the United States telling people about Jesus. That's what you can do. 
remember, we're not here just to live for our own selves, for our own lives. Keep it truthful. The blind man said exactly what happened. Be careful not to exaggerate your Jesus story, but don't underplay what Jesus has done in your life. This fourth one is so important. Keep it fresh. Keep your story fresh. How do you keep your Jesus story fresh? How do you keep all the many things that Jesus has done for you fresh? Here's how. In your time with Jesus, his grace and goodness and greatness and the gift of salvation you have and all the ways he's sustained you becomes a normal part of your prayer life. You're always so overwhelmed by what he's done. You're just thanking him and thanking him and you're, you're reliving in your mind some of the challenges of your life, some of the high points of your life and you're saying, God, how great you've been to bring me to this day in my life. I can't believe I'm alive for another day. You know, we sing in the Christian church, life is worth the living just because he, and that is so true. I don't think we do enough reflection. We're such a hectic society. I will add to that. I think we're so busy watching entertainment and going through Facebook that we're reflecting more on other people's lives than spending deep amounts of time in prayer with God, reflecting on what he's done with our lives so we can be a blessing to others. We're living vicariously through all the other people of this world rather than living for Jesus to reach this world. I, I'm a fan of the greatest theologian in the history of the United States. His name is Jonathan Edwards, lived in the 1700s. He's known as the greatest uh, theologian this country has ever known. He once said this, One day I rode out into the woods for my health in 1737. I got off my horse in a very quiet place in the woods, as my manner commonly has been. I wanted to walk for some divine contemplation and prayer. I had a view that for me was extraordinary of the glory of the Son of God as mediator between God and man and his wonderful, great, full, pure, and sweet grace and love and meek, gentle condescension which continued as near as I can judge about an hour, which kept me the greater part of the time in a flood of tears and weeping aloud. Compare that to our generation. Who would take an hour of time today to go walking alone like Enoch walked with God in private just to be with God and contemplate the beauty of his creation and the beauty of his work in our soul so that tears of gratitude spring forth and then we get back on our horse and get to business you see when was the last time you made time just to just to be with God and to cry before him and to cheer your heart in the presence of the Lord we're a deficient people if we don't take time to be with God so to, to share what Jesus has done keep it simple short truthful and fresh and keep it going. It's not only your story. May I say this? Your Jesus story is not ultimately about you. It's not about really sharing your story. Paul says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul had an amazing story. He would tell it from time to time, but he always used it as a platform to show people who Jesus is and what Jesus did. If you have a Jesus story as a Christian and you never share it with anyone else, you have to do some business on this matter with Jesus. Because it's not yours alone. The reason why Jesus healed the blind man, look at, well, you must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might dis be displayed in him. You're a Christian. And you're yet on heaven that people might see the works of God displayed in your life. 
If God didn't want to display his grace and goodness and greatness through your life, he'd take you to heaven by now. God isn't in the business of just keeping you going 70, 80 years for the sake of keeping you going 70 or 80 years. You're here to let people know Christ died, Christ rose, Christ is coming again. Eternal life and eternal death are before us. I don't even want to live another day if it's not a day with Jesus or for Jesus. Get me out of here as quickly as possible. There is no reason to live apart from Jesus Christ. But oh, Jesus, we will live as long as you want us to live to share the Jesus story with others. Haunting words, perhaps, for you, they are for me. Matthew 10, 32, listen to this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father is in heaven. Number four, our last thought. While it is day, use your story to point people to Jesus. In verse 12, by telling people where Jesus can be found. By telling people where Jesus can be found. Look at verse 12. Uh, they said to him, where is he? They want to know where this miracle man, this magic man, if you will, because they don't know anything about Jesus. Is he a charlatan? Is he real? Is he some sort of hocus pocus person? Where is he? And the blind man said, I do not know. Now, within the hour, he will know. But at this moment, I mean, imagine, you haven't seen for, we'll just say, 25 years of your life. Maybe he's older. What would it be like to just close your eyes for a moment and think of your whole life like that, and all of a sudden, your eyes are open for the first time? I mean, it's going to be awesome. Unbelievable. So he's just, like, taking his, his there's a song by, um, what was that? A guy named John Denver years ago, remember that guy? You fill up my senses. I mean, he had something theologically right, even if he worshiped creation, which we don't do, and so many do. But what happens is creation, in a sense, fills up our senses, our, our, our aesthetic senses for beauty, our wonder senses of imagination. Because if this is the beautiful sunrise of today, how much greater must the beauty of the creator of the sunrise be? Amen? In fact, Job says, this is incredible. Job says about sunrises and sunsets and lightning and thunder. These are but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? <laughs> oh my goodness. The northern lights, have you ever seen those? Video or something? That's just God giving you a little, little teaser. And so the blind man can see. And he doesn't know where Jesus is at this moment. But the implication of verse 12 is very clear. People want to know where this miracle Jesus is. And we know him as the son of the living God. And though the blind man at this moment did not know, we now know here at Over Isle Church. And the truth is this. We have to tell people where Jesus can be found. They were drawn into his story. And they ask, where is he? And while it is day, Use your time, however God leads you, to tell people where Jesus can be found. By the way, do you know where Jesus can be found? Before the world was made, he was found in heaven as the second person of the Trinity. Once the world was made, he appeared every now and then as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. He's also found in so many prophecies, types, pictures, allusions, shadows, and figures or characters in the Old Testament. Did you know that's where Jesus is found? Do you know that Jesus was then found in the womb of a virgin? Of all things, of all the crazy things that anyone could ever think about. Why would a world ruler, a king of kings, how could that be? Because the Bible tells us 
that the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary and Christ was conceived in the womb. Crazy and impossible to the human mind. With God, all things are possible. Jesus is found in the womb. He's then found in the manger. He's found for three years, walking on water, healing, proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's found on a cross, dying for the sin of humanity. He's found in a tomb, but only for three days. Then he's found for 40 days, instructing his disciples in things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And now he's found at the right hand of the Father. And he's found now here in the pages of Holy Scripture. And he's found right here in the gathered community. Jesus says that when God's people gather, I'm there. This is the lampstand. He walks among the lampstands of his people. He's here. He's in the sacrament, boys and girls, this is where we baptize children like you. This is where we have the, the meal, remembering and feasting on Jesus. He's, he's here. He's in your trials. He's in your tears. What a God he is. So tell people where Jesus can be found. I close with this story of a, of a pastor who went in for a haircut one day in Minnesota. His barber was a young Muslim woman, says this author. In the course of their conversation, he told her he was a pastor, that he believed in Jesus, and that later in the day he was going to perform a funeral. His Muslim barber replied, Once I was supposed to cut a dead man's hair, they were going to pay me $150, but I wouldn't do it. The pastor asked, why not? I don't like to touch the dead. I'm afraid they'll sit up. The pastor said, I know one who did. Ugh, you're kidding. No, I'm not, he replied. And then he told her about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the end of the, their time together, she asked, are you going to come here again? Yeah, I'll come back. And she ended by saying, I'd like to know more. I'd like to know more. You're just pointing people to Jesus, however you can. And God, the Holy Spirit, will work in them a I'd like to know more spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. You are faithful. You want us to share your story through what you've done in our life. And we in the Reformed Church have struggled with this, but I pray today that we would take to heart what you teach us from this blind man and his newly discovered sight. And may we become more and more a congregation of those who seek to make disciples and to point people to Jesus to prepare people for eternity. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand with us as we sing and worship our great God who gives sight to the blind. <laughs> I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you as you go and make disciples of all nations. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I believe. 